Welcome to Smart from the Start, presented by Care AI, the smart care facility platform company and leader in AI and ambient intelligence for healthcare. Join Steve Lieber, former CEO of HIMSS, as he interviews the brightest minds in the health provider space on truly transformative technologies that are modernizing healthcare. Hello, and welcome to Smart from the Start. I'm your host, Steve Lieber, and it is my pleasure to bring to you a series of conversations with some of the sharpest minds in health information technology. We'll discuss the smart directions healthcare companies and providers are pursuing to create smart care teams. Today, I'm joined by a longtime friend and I, I dare to say colleague, uh, John Glasser, uh, an individual known by, by many of you. But let me give you a little brief uh, intro in terms of John's background. John is an executive in resident at the Harvard Medical School and previously served in several senior executive roles in both vendor and provider organizations. He is a former senior vice president of population health at Cerner Corporation, chief executive officer of Siemens Health Services, and chief information officer at Partners Healthcare. John also has a long history in leading the professional associations in the area of health information technology. He was the founding chair of the College of Healthcare Information Management Executives, CHIME, and the past president of the Healthcare Information and Management Systems Society, HIMSS, and a former chair of the board of the American Telemedicine Association. John, welcome. Thank you, Steve. It's a great pleasure, and you're correct. You and I are longstanding and uh, good colleagues and friends, so it's a pleasure to spend some time with you. I, I appreciate that, and, and really, as I do look back over years that, that we don't need to articulate how many. It's been a lot of fun. And you are certainly someone that I always look forward to running into at conferences and other places uh, and to tap into to your thinking about what's going on. And that's exactly what we're going to do today. Uh, what I'd like to start out with is your role as an educator. You've done a lot of, of speaking in a variety of roles at uh, Hymns and Chime conferences, Chime boot camp, Warden, other places mm -hmm. where, where you've been on faculty. So what are you seeing in terms of both the state of education for practicing? So we're, we're not talking on the pure academic side, but yeah. on the practicing side. And what are we seeing coming out of, of the programs today? Well, Steve, uh, first of all, I really enjoy education. It's a lot of fun. And particularly at the postgraduate, this master's level and the, you know, executive education level, et cetera. And so I think, you know, and having simple taught at Warden for a dozen years. And so what you could see is in the 12 years ago, very interested in the electronic health record, what was going on. Meaningful use was here. Uh, and now that's yesterday's news for most of these students. You know, they're interested in AI, they're interested in mobile devices, and things like that. So obviously what you teach and talk about moves is the technology moves. You know, AI was not as big of a topic a dozen years ago as it is now. And when you get into executive education, they've got scar tissue. They've been around the track. You know, they've been in big organizations. They know how politics can be hard and change can be hard. And so, and they're very action oriented. So there they are much more interested in, well, you know, how do I do this and how do I do that? There's a lot of focus these days, Steve, on digital transformation. What does that mean? How do we do it? Why is it so hard? Why, is it, why does it fail so often, et cetera? So I enjoy helping those people be better, more effective, and more knowledgeable. And you know, I'll give you an example that they had. Sometimes organizations think about digital transformation. It's a project. It has a beginning and an end. And the answer is there is no end. You will always be transforming, okay? And that's just the kind of insight and understanding that can happen. And obviously, in, particularly in Harvard, you know, we, uh, I think the Zoom technology is better than I would have thought, although not as good as in person, but still, you know, you can get people from across the planet. So in the courses I teach, you know, two thirds are from outside the U.S. And so there's a variety of experiences. So the person who's the CEO of the hospital in Mongolia is talking to the person who is a pharmacy rep in the Middle East. And it's interesting how much they learn from each other. So I think, you know, as the field moves, the topics move, and as they get more senior and more uh, organizational exposure, they tend to be more focused on practical how to do various things, et cetera. And I do think, you know, you who teach and I who teach, you know, you can have a broad impact. We've taught in one of my courses, 800 people this year. Uh, that's good. You know, so I don't hope they're not screwed up by this process, but nonetheless, you know, those 800 people are probably going to be more effective than they were before. Yeah. So one of the things that, that I've 
heard, especially around clinicians, and I would expect in your programs, you're going to have a mix of pure sure. management types as well as clinicians who have an interest in, in other aspects other than pure clinical practice, is that the expectation, the, the technological expectation when they walk into a provider organization, say, is higher today mm -hmm. in terms of what they're expecting to find in the way of tools because of how they grew up. Is, is that pretty valid? Oh, I think that's quite fair, Steve. I mean, in, in the, when I first began, there was a generation of uh, clinicians who had never really had any exposure to the technology, were suspicious of it, you know, had to be trained about it, uh, viewed it with a bit of apprehension and dread, et cetera. And uh, for pretty soon after they started using it, their, you know, their fears were confirmed. You know, it's, you know oh, yikes, just think they're all yes. uh, et cetera. But I think you've got a generation now, I was looking at some data yesterday, the average teenager in the U.S. spends five hours a day on social media, on average, you know, and games, et cetera. So they are, they expect it to be useful. They expect it to be easy to use. They expect that it will help in lots of ways. And sometimes they're really quite taken aback when they get into our organizations and they say, golly, this stuff has been around since the stone age and it's complicated and hard to do. So I do think in the clinicians, the, the sort of familiarity expectations are different. The other thing I think Steve has gone on is if you go into the boardroom, you know, when I first began in this field, which is in the mid eighties, you know, as a CIO, boards really didn't have a clue about IT. You know, they didn't, they didn't grow up with it. They didn't really understand it. It was a you know, expense. It every now and then screwed up and caused all kinds of havoc. And now you've got board members who are in their forties and they grew up with this stuff. They expect it to be strategically compelling. They know it's hard. Um, so you've got some seasoned, insightful people at the board level that you just really didn't have, you know, 30 years ago. That, that's great insight. I hadn't really thought about that at the board level. Certainly, we, we're faced with it daily in terms of our teams and ongoing operations, but yeah. from a higher strategic and, and governance level. You're absolutely right. That generation has changed or is changing mm -hmm. as well. You got several things there that I want to unpack. One, sure. you mentioned history in terms of people with clinicians that when we started to install certain things 15, 20 years ago, it didn't quite turn out the way they were expecting. And, and there was a lot of resistance. Let, let's start there in terms of what we learned from the EHR implementation process. Um, because I mean, you were very involved sure. in terms of all aspects from being a, an installer at a provider organization to being a seller in, in a company. Uh, deeply involved in the policy as well and government regulation and, and that sort of thing and advising uh, numerous government officials and, and administrations. So as we look back, um, I'm going to believe that we're going to say, yeah, it was all worth it. In fact, it probably was the necessary foundation for us to be able to do what we're doing today. But your take on on that, what we went through. Well, I mean, Steve, it's you, clearly a necessary foundation. I mean, it's hard to, you, you and I couldn't sit here and say, boy, Healthcare would be better off if we all went back to paper. You know, what that would, boy, what a sigh of relief and what an improvement we see. Come on. You know, that, now that doesn't mean we don't have a lot of issues with what we have, but nobody would say that with any, you know, really a straight face here. I think a couple of things have been learned over the years. One of which is the surest way to screw it up is to have the people who are expected to be using the systems believe that they are victims. You know, you're doing this to them. To, you know, they have no say. They're being dragged along, kicking and screaming. And I don't care who you are. You know, it could be a doc, you could be a banker, you know, or an auto mechanic. You're not going to like that, period. Uh, so the thing you learn is you got to engage them and you got to give them control. One of the things you see, see, when you do, when you look at when digital transformations, when they happen and are successful, why are they successful? And most aren't. You know, only about a third are. Uh, two thirds fail at a variety of levels, et cetera. But one of the things that you see as a success factor is they push the driving of the project as low as possible. They put the people on the front lines in charge. Now they have a broad direction. We're going to go left versus right. But nonetheless, you know, the format that it's going to take, that's your call. Uh, and you put them in charge. So you take them out of victims into being the drivers. And that has an amazing impact on what they will do. That's sort of one part. The other part is you say, listen, you know, the change that we have is a never ending incremental process. We're going to take a step and assess, take a step and assess, take a step and assess. You know, we're going to iterate our way incrementally. We want a big step, not tiny little baby steps. So that eases the burden of familiarity. I'm not really going to be scared to death. It's just such a big leap. We're going to take it and I'm in control of the assessment and what we do next, uh, et cetera. So the other is that when you introduce the change, you do so over periods of time. 
one of the things that the digital transformation takes years, decades. It's not like you do it in two years and you're done. Your brand new spanking organization looks really different than you were before. So give them control and move it incrementally in steps that sort of help them, you know, move along uh, with that stuff. And then you get rid of barriers to the degree. You give them time, you give them money, you know, you make sure the vendors know what they're doing. Uh, if things screw up, you help, you know, go in there and rescue uh, teams that go along the way. So I, I think it's, you know, what's frightened me, Steve, is the things that you and I learned doing implementation, the generation that succeeds us will learn all over again. And the generation that succeeds them will learn all over again. Um, so no, I'm, I remember talking to a guy, Warren McFarland, who was a professor at the Harvard Business School, 50 years, had done in IT. And I said, Warren, I know the technology has changed in 50 years, but what hasn't? He said two things. Timing still matters. You can be too early or too late to the market. And the second, organizations are hard to change. It's like raising kids. You know, the, the things you learn raising and being a father, your father learned. And your kids as fathers will learn all over again. So the other thing we learn is that every generation is going to go through the, you know, the same relearning uh, of this sort of highly experiential process. Yeah, yeah, we hope that there's something we passed on that you don't have to go through because I yeah. went through it for you. But yeah, there, there are limits to how far that's going to go. It's like being taught about, you know, raising a kid. Sure, you'll do book learning, you'll talk to some colleagues, but you're still going to go through it you're still you know, gonna, in yeah. your own way. Yeah. So there, in, in several of your comments, you've talked about iteration as well as people walking into healthcare and finding out exactly how far along healthcare is compared to, to other places. And healthcare does regularly get bashed for being yeah. behind the curve, slow to adopt new technology, status quo driven, and that sort of thing. Is this fair? And, and, and sort of give me a, a, a further elaboration on some points you've made in terms of, of where healthcare is and why we may have to do things a particular yeah. way and, and that sort. But we do. We get beat up on this point a lot. Yeah, and I think by and large, it's unfair. I mean, if you, one thinks we get beat up, we don't spend enough. And you say, well, if you actually look at the spending, it's pretty middle of the pack here. It's mm -hmm. not as high as banking or insurance, but it's not way down the bottom 5%. That's for darn sure, et cetera. And you say, you got to be careful of the implication that healthcare is full of a bunch of laggards and Neanderthals who really don't want to move. That's not true at all. You've got some of the brightest, most, you know, driven people in the world, you know, running these things and, you know, wanting to do a good job here. I think a couple of things get in the way, one of which the incentive system is still volume based by and large. So, you know, why would I spend money on this stuff or go through the implementation agony if there's no real upside? Come on, let's get real, you know, about this kind of stuff. You know, we're progressively moving to value-based care and that may help. The second is, you know, if you look at the nature of the work, it is arguably the most complex industry that exists. The knowledge domain, massive in its size and, you know, growing exponentially. The nature of the work from very routine, run a chemistry test to how do we do a really complex diagnosis. The political structures are complicated. It's one of the few, there are only three social economic goods in our industry today. Religion, education, and healthcare. We have to balance the societal mission with the economic mission, et cetera. So, you know, you say this and golly, it's got a knowledge base, it's complex, it's processes are complex, it's politically complex, it's got the wrong incentives. Well, hello, uh, you know, the IT will not be as far along as in other industries where those factors are lessened, you know, or, or more relaxed. All industries are complicated. I got it. Uh, but you could argue that, that, you know, we're trying to automate something which has no peer in terms of complexity. We still got to get on with it because there's a lot we can do, et cetera. But we shouldn't bash ourselves because we're not moving that fast because it's not possible to move that fast, not in a thoughtful way, in an effective way. Well, and, and I think there are a lot of things we can point to of successes and advances sure. in terms of the technology and the impact on outcomes and, and, and such that really do indicate that, that this is not, as you said, a, a laggard sector. Yeah, I mean, you look at, you know, this, you know, the sort of extraordinary adoption of telehealth of the pandemic. Holy smokes, you know, in a very short period of time, right. overnight, totally. that yep. fundamentally went up, et cetera. And you say, that did some real good. Uh, it had, you know, it was probably a little too fast, a little rough around the edges in some cases, but still. That but we had to. Good. It is like. You sure. had no choice. You, yeah, you couldn't let did. anybody in the place, so you had well, to reach out going. to You know, doctors <laughs> were coming in and patients were coming in. You had to do something. Yeah. As we look over the, the past 15, 20 years, uh, and really it's continuing today, we've seen multiple occasions of non-healthcare companies coming into healthcare. Mm -hmm. And in the past, 
a lot of them made it for a year or two and then they disappeared. And yeah. then two or three or five or six years later, they came back and that's that sort of thing. We're seeing it again. Uh, yeah. And and we're it may be in some slightly different uh, configurations in terms of more partnerships between yeah. big non healthcare tech and provider organizations. What are you seeing in terms of non healthcare tech coming into the healthcare sector? What's the outlook there? Well, I think Steve, we will continue to have, and perhaps for the rest of time, organizations that say, "Geez, this is a gazillion dollar industry. It's all messed up." They really could use our help. We did a great over this other industry. We'll just sort of port it in and they hit the, you know, like the old and the Greek mythology of the sirens that lead you onto the rocks. Uh, and away you, it will always have that kind of aspect. I do think, and actually working on this article now, Steve, which basically says if, you know, if you look at quote industries that have been quote disrupted, who disrupted them and to what degree did they really get disrupted? And you might say, and it turns out that the incumbents in the industry are largely the, the disruptors. It's the incumbents who drive the disruption. And they, in fact, the incumbents emerge stronger than they were before. You go through banking. Bank of America is still huge. JP Morgan is still huge. Morgan Stanley is still huge. You know, you go in the insurance company, Cigna is still huge, all these, et cetera. So what you don't really see, if you, occasionally you do, like the taxi cab, that is where someone comes in and, and the incumbents would disappear or get clobbered and all this kind of stuff here, et cetera. So I think one of the things that sort of we, the broader ecosystem in healthcare, have to appreciate is the incumbents, the providers, actually have a lot of strengths here. And if they're smart about it, they'll lead the disruption, you know, and, and they're beginning to do that. You see that in ICU with the patient experience or virtual care, et cetera. So where we'll work effectively is not when you have incumbent disruptor, you know, battling each other, is we say, we're going to work together to make this happen. I appreciate health system. You will be the driver because you can scale and you understand all this complexity that I really don't. But I'm here to help apply my technology and my resources, et cetera, to make that happen. So what I do think we're seeing, Steve, is a generation of folk big, you know, the Googles and the Microsofts and the Amazons and startups coming through that if they're smart, are humbler about what they know and don't know, and also realize that the disruption is through their customer, not them. Uh, largely they'll help with that. They can bring all kinds of stuff that will go through this. That, that, that will work. And I see that sort of, you know, humility or appreciation, uh, more so now than we, you know, saw you know, over the, over the decades before. Yeah. As I listen to you, I'm, I'm struck by you continuing to be a student of healthcare. I mean, mm -hmm. in your references in terms of your continued reading as well as your teaching and, and, and that sort of thing. So. Let's talk about where things are going. And yeah. you've got you've got a, an insight. Uh, you know, one you've got significant history, but you're you're current. You're looking ahead and, and that sort of thing. Everybody's talking about artificial intelligence. Sure. Yeah, you, you can't have a conversation in healthcare without talking about it. And and we all know the Gartner hype cycle and where we are on that uh, cycle up for some discussion. But I think we're in the hype area. Yeah, sure. uh, what, what's your read in terms of where this is going, um, its value, its its contribution, its impact? Yeah, I think one of the things that's interesting to me, Steve, is, is if you go back over the use of like, computers in the business community writ large, go you know, back to the 60s, you know, I think you see about every 10 years, a major technology innovation occurs that changes the world. Uh, the mainframe in the 60s, the minis in the 70s, the network personal computers in the 80s, you know, the 90s was the web. You know, Google was founded in 1998. And the 2000s was the mobile device. The iPhone debuted in 2007. You, know, you could argue 2100 was kind of the internet of things. Uh, and here we're in this era of AI. So it's one of those, it's a big deal. And it's like its predecessors, the world will be different uh, because of this thing. You know, you and I know how big, how different the world is because of the web. Now uh, you think about what that meant and how. So there you go, it's big. And you're right. As we all know, there's the hype cycle and we got a lot of unwarranted optimism and we've got some pessimism too. Hallucinations will kill people. You know, this kind of stuff here. Uh, it's got to go on here. I do think, it, and when you look at it, it takes a very long period of time for mature use to really be understood of a technology. It takes decades, frankly, and it's still evolving. So, you know, you look at the web and we're still learning about using of the internet for screwing up the political process. You know, you can still see, you know, we're learning a lot in the last couple of years about how that's gone on, et cetera. So I think we will be learning for quite some time about AI, what to do. My general advice to health systems and 
we do this through the Scottsdale Institute, et cetera, is you got to go through a multi-year process of learning. Try things, you know, talk to your colleagues, go to conferences, read, you know, whatever it is, you know, talk to consultants, invite Google, Microsoft, all those people in to give you an overview of what they're up to. But learn and share that learning and begin to cut your teeth on it. Now, I think what we'll see, Steve, one is we see areas where it's in place now. I mean, chatbots, uh, the Google lady who gets you map. You know, make sure you don't get lost. You know, there's, it's all over the place already and pretty mature use. And you can see some examples like digital therapeutics where people deal with postpartum depression. Wow, it's just really cool. You know how slick that stuff is. I think most of that use will be there, you know, in that kind of consumer-oriented stuff, but also in the sort of administrative areas of healthcare. And so this is completing the note for the doctor. This is uh, looking at... Um, you know, utilization management or prior authorization, et cetera. And largely because it's, the ROI can be clearer about what's it really I'm going to get here. Uh, if it makes a mistake, it's less consequential than hurting somebody along the way. Um, and so that's where we'll cut it. Uh, and I think this notion of robot docs a little far-fetched, uh, et cetera. But so that may be a little further out uh, that, we, you know, that we have to go for, to make all this stuff happen. So anyway, I, I think we'll, we'll creep, but we'll start with the administrative side, plus the stuff that's already ingrained you know, yep. and then what we do. Yeah, Judy Faulkner just last month at uh, EGM f announced that Epic's focus with artificial intelligence was going to be on in basket yeah, notes, nice. coding, reimbursement, this sort of so administrative functions and that sort of thing. And so it, it seems like that is the direction at least major players like that are headed. Yeah, and I think, Steve, a couple of things. One is we, we have to be thoughtful enough to realize there's different classes of AI. You know, there's the generative stuff, which sort of summarizes in notes. That's different from the stuff that says predict. That says, by the way, John Glasser is going to be a real, you know, is it heading south, frankly, on his care. We look a little wobbly here, which is different from what I call classification, which basically the AI says, this is a tumor of the following type, you know, or pattern. So anyway, all three are in play, although we're all excited about generative uh, at this point. The other thing that's striking to me too is, you know, on the one hand, see, we say it's going to transform healthcare. Oh, for God's sakes, I hate that word. You know, we're going, to be, we're going to disrupt the hell out of it. And I say, I'm sure it will over time. But if you look at it, it's going to summarize the in-basket note. That's transformational. Now, it's a good thing to do. Don't get me wrong here. But we're t the point is we're taking really modest steps in issue. That's yeah. fine. That's where yeah. you start. You know, it is, and transformation happens over time. It's not this big step function where all of a sudden you go from being, you know, six feet tall to 12 feet tall. That's just not what happens. And these kinds of things are so in a way they look pretty modest, but they're, they're the start. That's how you, that's how this stuff works. And you build on that. And you build from there. Yeah. You've, you sat in the CIO chair. You've also sat in the CEO of a, a company chair, um, at, at major platform, uh, organizations like Siemens and, and, uh, Cerner. As we look at technologies as they've come in, there are usually a whole lot of players and then there mm -hmm. are big players in the same space. We'll use uh, d uh, data analytics as an area. Yeah. And as I just mentioned, Epic is, has identified what they're going to do in terms of building into the platform AI. Is that the likely trajectory that there are going to be point solutions as well as platform solutions? And again, looking at it from both perspectives as you've been, where would you advise uh, CIOs to be looking in terms of as you bring technology in? Make sure it goes into the platform. Yeah, you're going to need some point solutions. It'll be a blend. Uh, what, what's your, your take on that? Yeah, I think, the, the, you know, I think what isn't particularly wise is to be at either end of the spectrum. You might say, boy, if Vendor X doesn't have it, I ain't interested. You know, I'm true blue. You know, that, come on. You know, that's, that's a little, a little, I mean, I appreciate, appreciate the purity, but that's a little too much. Um, the other is, hey, man, it's Firebase. We can stitch all kinds of stuff together. Well, let's get real, you know, about how that really does work or fits into the workflow, et cetera. One of the things that's striking me, see, and particularly if you look at, the, you know, the growth of health systems, they're just getting larger, you know, and more sophisticated, et cetera, which what that means is they now have the IT talent that actually can afford and understands how to deal with different technologies. They, the, they may be true to their vendor, but they're not so true that they're not willing to try different things. So my general view of an IT is it's fine and expected that you will go out and work with companies that aren't as large as Epic or Oracle, Cerner or Meditech, et cetera, that have really cool ideas. And you want to do that. 
because you want to learn and you want, and for all you know, this is really a breakthrough technology of some form. And for all you know, they're going to get acquired as part of a larger model. So I do think, you know, you ought to be, you know, don't go wild uh, and bring everything in that you can, but it's certainly uh, prudent and smart to go out and to work with small, medium-sized companies that really have cool and innovative ideas. Uh, not all the smart people live in Madison, Wisconsin or Kansas City. You know, I mean, there are some smart people. They don't all live there. Uh, and so you got to be, you tap into this sort of rich set of talent uh, that exists across the board. Excellent. So, John, to wrap up, our listeners are CIOs, CMIOs, CNIOs, chief digital officers, that, that whole crowd. Right. Um, so what's your takeaway here? What's the, the one thing that you'd want to share with, with that group that, that you think might be something that they can take away? Well, I think, first of all, it's just a really exciting time. You know, I'm some, always wish I had another, who knows how long I'll live or you will live too, see, but golly, we're, it's much more interesting than it was 30 years ago. That's for darn sure. It's that, yeah. uh, I think, you know, the basic, and it sounds kind of, uh, you know, almost slogan like here is there's no question that technology can really improve the delivery of care, the financing of care, the accessibility of care. So you, we all understand and appreciate how potent this stuff is. And it's getting more potent all the time here, et cetera. So you're in a remarkable position to help your organization achieve its mission, its goals, et cetera, of delivering care. You really are. That being said, you got to remember a couple of things. One is the skill, the bar on skills, having been with Chime for a long time. You know, if you know, it used to be that if you were got a letter grade A as a CIO 10 years ago because of your communication skills, your team building skills, that's a letter B today. You know, the bar just keeps getting raised, not just for you, but for the C-suite writ large. So you just keep working on your skills and, you know, this, that, and the other because the bar gets raised and it needs to, et cetera. The other thing to remember is a digital, the adoption of the technology is a team sport. It's a sport that you do in conjunction with chief medical officer, chief nursing officer, CFO, et cetera, and the front line, back to the earlier comment that we do here. So you got to be, just remember, it's not, yes, it's you, I got it, but it's really you, the member of a team and who knows how to pull together a team and get the team to work effectively, not only that your team, but laterally across the organization, that kind of team here. So, you know, underappreciate the, the sort of remarkable opportunity you have to shape healthcare. Do keep working on your skills and do remember that it is a team sports. And, you know, we do that. And over the course of time, we'll make all kinds of progress. Outstanding. John, as always, it is an absolute treat to, to be able to spend time with you. And I certainly do appreciate you being with us today. Well, thanks, Steve. It's a pleasure to spend time with you. And uh, I have great questions and I hope people find the answers interesting. I'll Excellent. Look forward Again. to seeing you next time we get together. Excellent. Thank you. And to our listeners, thank you for joining us. I hope this series does help you make healthcare smarter and move at the speed of tech. Be well. Thanks for listening to Smart from the Start. For best practices in AI and ambient intelligence and ways your organization can help lead the era of smart hospitals, visit us at smarthospital.ai. And for information on the leading smart care facility platform, visit care.ai.